All right, well, good evening and welcome to our 16th lecture. I hope this has been a great uh, lecture series for you all. I know that it was really a, there's been a, a, a fantastic time teaching it. And again, this the, the writing process, I said, when I'm done with this, um, again, I think I have two more church figures to discuss, lecture on, however you want to want to say that, um, on this topic, and then it will be coming out in a book form. So I'll look forward to doing that. Again, that's going to be Lord willing through Kingdom Press um, sometime next year. Um, so, yeah, so here we are, Lecture 16, and tonight we are going to be looking at John Chrysostom. John Chrysostom. Some of you may have heard of him, some of you have not. Um, but he is definitely a uh, exegete, one of the key exegetes of the early church. And um, yeah, it's 347 to 407, still in that kind of uh, um, earlier part of, well, later part of the early church, if you will. Um, but nevertheless, uh, tonight we are going to, well, I'm going to be examining his, his work called On the Incomprehensible Nature of God. But first, a little background about John. Uh, he was the, was the Archbishop of Constantinople, being the most prolific of all the Eastern Fathers. Okay? He fought against the ecclesiastical and political leaders for their abuse of authority. He was called Chrysostom, meaning golden-mouthed. Golden Mouth for his eloquent sermons. He's got his series on Romans is is a classic. Um, now he is not uh, reformed in the sense that we would, uh, you know, like or, or call somebody reformed. Um, again, that was not till really uh, Augustine did uh, the reformed strand of, of understanding predestination election really start to emerge. Uh, again, I heard somebody on Facebook. Well, didn't hear anybody. Sorry, read someone on Twitter actually or X. Try to make an argument about premillennialism, saying how all the early church fathers in the first 300 years, if you read them, they are premillennial. That kind of solves the debate. Um, but ultimately, uh, historical arguments like that are not very persuasive, knowing that, again, there's, I think, the same gentleman that might have made that response. I believe he's reformed. He holds to predestination and election. So if we're going to make an historical argument saying who talked about it first, giving it authority, well... Uh, a lot of the early church fathers did not talk about election and predestination in the manner that, uh, that Augustine did and how we actually understand today in our developed Calvinistic understanding. So with that said, back to him. So yeah, he's the most distinguished of the Greek patristic preachers, excelled in spiritual and moral application in the Antiochian tradition of literal exegesis, largely disinterested even in speculative, I'm sorry, even untutored in speculative and controversial theology. Now, what I like about this uh, lecture tonight and, and, and kind of going through Chrysostom is that the early church fathers that we have gone through already are, are very speculative. I mean, they, again, they do an excellent job of grounding the metaphysical doctrines in, in biblical exegesis. But here we have a guy that was, was not in that strand of doing dogmatics that kind of thing, but what's fascinating about him, and I, and again, this was kind of what was one of the reasons why I, I wrote this series is to highlight the doctrine of divine simplicity. And so here's a guy that wants to stay away from speculative doctrines, <clears throat> but yet he takes that simplicity doctrine as a normative statement of God. So pretty fascinating. We'll get to it. So I want to get to it now. So again, we're going to be going through on the on the incomprehensible nature of God. The short term is de incomp. That's just short for the Latin phrase. So I'm going to call it de incomp. So if you hear that phrase, I'm referring to on the incomprehensible nature of God. And uh, yeah, obviously he's written many other works, but we're going to go through this one. And he has it kind of broken up in a series of homilies. A lot of his his works were polemical and and apologetical. Um, well, this one is specifically, I'm sorry. And so um, he kind of breaks it down this way. So we'll get into it. Um, so this work, as noted, is a polemical and apologetical work aimed at a new uprising of Arian followers. Now again, Arianism, as we've been discussing, is the common heresy that the early church had to deal with. Now this new crop of extremists were known as Anomoians. Anomoians. They maintain that God is simple in one, unbegotten and not produced. 
No being, therefore, could be begotten or produced, thus no being could be of the same substance, homoousios, of similar substance, homoousios, or like, homoios, God. But it must be dissimilar and unlike, anamoios, God, hence the names, anomoyens. <laughs> That's kind of a mouthful. Uh, so, so basically... He says that it must be dissimilar and unlike God. So that is their angle, right? That is their angle. So while man cannot know the essence of God, the Anamoyans call the divine essence agonetos, which means ungendered. The Anamoyans argue that if we do not know God's essence, then we do not know what we are adoring. But Chrysostom responds that we are not required to know what God is, just that he is. We can know who he is without needing to know what his essence is. Thus, speculation of his essence is not expected of us. Now, this work is divided up into 12 homilies. With the first five dealing with the incomprehensible nature of God. The sixth is an interruption of sorts with number 7 through 12, number 7 through 12, Focus on the Son's substance being the same, homoousios, as the Father. Chrysostom does not write with the theological depth as we find like in Basil or Gregory of Nyssa or Gregory of Nazianzus. His audience is primarily made up of laymen, unorthodox, and heterodox, who he's trying to edify and sway from error. So in his first homily, he begins with a confession of his own humble ignorance regarding his knowledge about God, but lacks the ability to explain it. And he writes, I know that God is everywhere, and I know that he is everywhere in his whole being, but I do not know how he is everywhere. I know that he is eternal and has no beginning, but I do not know how. My reason fails to grasp how it is possible for an essence to exist when that essence has received his existence neither from itself nor from another. I know that he begot a son, but I do not know how. I know that the Spirit is from him, but I do not know how the Spirit is from him. So his point is to direct his opponents away from meddling with the essence of God. He sees that such inquisitiveness is the very height of folly, pointing out how the inspired prophets of Scripture were unable to grasp the vastness of his wisdom, which comes from his essence. So how foolish and mad is it that the Anonomians, Anomoians, that's a hard word, think that they could make his very essence subject to their power and processing of reasoning. Chrysostom quotes the prophet of grace, who he refers to as David, who in speaking of God's omnipresence is dumbfounded at the realization that whether he goes up to heaven or down to hell, God is there. And that's from Psalm 139, verse 8. And while God has revealed secret and hidden things to David, he says God's wisdom is inaccessible <clears throat> and incomprehensible, having no limit. And that's from Psalm 147, verse 5. Again, Chrysostom is rebuking and exhorting the Anamoians to let go of their arrogant assertions, thinking that they can limit God's essence and his greatness. Chrysostom addresses the Anamoians' interpretation of 1 Corinthians 13, 12, which says, My knowledge is imperfect now, then I shall know even as I was known. End quote. For some strange reason, the Anamoians... Anomoians <laughs> state Paul is talking about God's governance of the universe. I'll drink water real quick. Chrysostom replies that Paul is saying that his present knowledge of God is imperfect and in part. And when we see Chrysostom invoke the normative assumption about God's essence, he continues, he says, Paul did not say imperfect because he knows one part of God's essence and does not know another part, for God is simple and has no parts. End quote. So that's that phrase I was telling you about, how Christostom just throws it in there. There's no way of trying to metaphysically articulate it. Uh, he doesn't uh, provide a lot of uh, biblical context to develop that, that doctrine. It's normative. So it's quite fascinating. 
So God's essence is unknown to us, therefore we know he exists, is wise, is great, is omnipresent, provides and cares for his creation. We do not know the extent of these attributes, nor how he does all the things in the governance of his creation. God is simple and has no parts. So what is fascinating about his reference to the simplicity of God is that modern theology sees simplicity as a speculative doctrine. You'll see that in a lot of literature. There's a lot of discussion about that. Not from like, you know, heterodox thinkers. Now there, there are those that are out there, but you know, those within the, the kind of the landscape of the Christian tradition that have a real problem with simplicity, because it's why it's too metaphysical, it's too speculative. But Chrysostom, who deliberately avoids speculative theo theolog ugh, theologizing, theologizing theologizing, there we go, refers to simplicity as a standard article of theology proper. The reason why divine simplicity is seen as an abstruse doctrine is due to the common modern mistake of assuming that divine simplicity actually describes something about God. But rather properly understood, as we've been discussing, simplicity is what? What is it? It's a negative statement that tells us what God is not. It tells us that he's not composite like creatures are. In a sense, it is intended to be abstruse because of its function in theological metaphysical discourse. God, as Chrysostom states, does not have parts. He is what he is through himself. Thus, his true essence, his divine constitution, is simple. And while Chrysostom aims to confine his doctrinal formulations to the biblical text, not in a biblicist fashion, however, he employs this, the specific nomenclature of divine simplicity in his theology. So, so why does he take simplicity for granted? Because of the implications derived from the biblical revelation of God. He sees that the God of the Bible is transcendent, thus incomprehensible, and apophatic language provides an appropriate framework to speak about the God we cannot comprehend. So in homily 2... Chrysostom continues his response, rebuking the Anomians for their blasphemous assumption that they can know God as God knows himself. In their meddling of God, the Anomians bring down the divine essence to fit their own pros processes of thought. Chrysostom cites Isaiah 40, verse 22, who was engaged in similar discourse of demonstrating the transcendence of the one true God as the creator and lord of the universe, to idol worshippers. That's that section of Isaiah 40 through 48. Isaiah directs his audience's attention to God as creator, demonstrating how he surpasses anything we can comprehend in that he spoke the universe into existence above which God sits enthroned and considers as nothing. His unfathomable, unfathomableness, I need to start giving myself smaller words, don't I? His unfathomableness is demonstrated in that scripture and our senses show the vastness of God's creation. Nevertheless, God created it with ease. All the nations, Chrysostom notes, though expansive and many, scripture says are, quote, like a drop in the bucket before him, end quote. That's from Isaiah 40, verse 15. The myriad of angels, thrones, dominations, and principalities, quote, God made all these powers with such ease that no words can explain it. The mere act of God's will was enough to make them all, end quote. God's act of willing brought forth the universe. Chrysostom, with great pity, says to the Anomians, quote, Tell me, when you hear this, did you, do you not weep for yourself? Do you not bury, bury yourself in the earth because you have lifted yourself to such a pitch of madness that you are playing the busybody and striving to meddle with God, end quote? pretty condemning words. In bringing down God to creaturely apprehension, the Anomians are, quote, treating him as something worthless when he is inestimable. <clears throat> as with Isaiah and all the other prophets and authors of Scripture, Old and New Testaments, the distance between God and man is the dialectic of debate. So too in contemporary theology, the dialectic of, dis of distance, the ontological otherness, is always in tension. And we see that in a lot of literature between classical theists, relational theists, 
Um, you see that with um, Arminians and Calvin, Calvins, Calvin, <laughs> Arminians and Calvinists, Calvinisms. So there's that tension that we see quite a bit. And in my opinion, I, I think what really helps ground, not ground it, but I guess you could say maybe relieve that tension is the doctrine of theosis. I think theosis within a reformed construct, classical construct, is that kind of bridging gap between the straight up Eastern Orthodox and, and relational theists and open theists and process theists. I'm not saying that they're all the same. I mean, just kind of met metaphysically speaking. Um, but I should probably keep the Eastern Orthodox as a little out of that because relational theists, open theists, and process theists, they definitely have a lot of problems. Uh, but they share the similar uh, attributes. Uh, sorry, similar understanding of, of the metaphysical understanding of, of who God is. And so the relational part is very important to that strand of thought. Classical theists maintain that distinction quite a bit. Um, you know, some would say it's it's really to a fault at times because of always seeing this constant um, focus on the negative attributes. And, and I agree with that. Um, I see things on Twitter where guys are always constantly quoting classical theologians and, and just referring to all these negative attributes in... It kind of gets like, okay, that's enough already. Uh, we, we get that. It's All you're really doing is saying something not about God. So there's a need for it. It's a need to, to give us guardrails on expressing our doctrine of God to keep us from falling into creatureliness. So truly, truly needed and helpful. But when that's all I see in here, it, it, it just kind of gets a little tiresome. So anyways, off that soapbox. All right, so, <clears throat> so Paul, the Apostle Paul, Paul shows this distinction, we're talking about the, this ontological otherness, between God and man using a potter and clay analogy, showing the vast distinction between God and creatures. But even then, Chrysostom notes, the distance between the essence of God and the essence of man is so great that no words can express it. The implication in Paul's potter clay analogy is to show us that we are clay in the potter's hands, who has the power of excuse me, and the right to turn, shape, and form as he pleases. Paul's intentions, Christosom writes, is not to, quote, deprive us of our freedom, nor destroy our power to choose. Rather, he spoke that he might do more and more to curb the arrogance of our tongues, end quote. Chrysostom notes that the arrogance Paul was addressing was not as great as the Anomians. Anomians. Gosh, that word's terrible. Anyways, his audience was inquisitive of God's will, his governance. Why is one man punished, one finds mercy, or one escapes vengeance? But they were not meddling with the essence of God. So again, Chris Austin is making the point that Paul's audience was nothing like his. Um, they were at least um, orthodox. Um, but the Ananomians' actions are antithetical to the way of faith. Not that we show faith not that we show faith blindly, rather we are called to show faith in that which we cannot comprehend, trusting God as Abraham did, quote, fully convinced that what God had promised he was able to do, Romans 4, 17, even if we cannot comprehend how. See, that's it. The how is the unfathomableness. We see that it is, but the how is absolute, absolute mystery to us. The resurrection is the pinnacle of mystery. No power of reasoning can understand it, which is what the ultimate demonstration of faith is, to know the power of his resurrection, which Paul makes as his aim and his goal. For Christostom, the glory of God is untarnished whether man praises him to his best ability or dishonors him as the Anomians. God always abides in his own glory. God's glory is brought down by the Anamoeans in the, quote, madness and folly of their arrogance to claim they can grasp the ineffable God, quote, who is beyond our intelligence, invisible and comprehensible, who transcends the power of mortal words, end quote. In their extravagant boasting, they reduce themselves to, quote, creatures who crawl on the ground, end quote, end quote, excuse me. Chrysostom's acerbic tone may seem out of place, but for him, such claims put one's salvation at stake and therefore demands to be called out for what it is, blasphemy. And I agree. <sighs> to further expose the radical disparity in the Anomian's claims, whoops, 
Hold a second, I gotta stop my clock. Okay. Sorry about that. See, I have a, a grandfather clock, and the clock, the clocking, the clicking, I know this picks up a lot in this, so I just need to remember to stop it for a second. All right. Where was that? Okay, to further expose the radical disparity in the Anomians' claims, Chrysostom postponed Chrysostom, <laughs> Chrysostom poses another challenge for them. Citing Paul, who says the Lord dwells in unapproachable light, 1 Timothy 6.16, he asks the heretic, what does this mean? It does not say the one who is in unapproachable light, but rather it is the light that is unapproachable. Interesting. So by way of argumentum a fortiori, Chrysostom observes if, the, if, observes if the light is unapproachable, how much more so is the one who dwells in it? I bet you never thought of that passage that way before. I always think of, of God, of Christ being unapproachable, but the light is unapproachable. <clears throat> so to be unapproachable means that one cannot investigate or come near to it. The seraphim must cover their faces because the light, the very essence of God, is beyond their ability to see and comprehend. What they could behold was, quote, a condescension accommodated to their nature, end quote. And God accommodates his revelation in relation to the weakness of, of the vision of creatures. We, we have creaturely eyes, right? We can't see divine divinity in itself. We can't. While Isaiah stated that he saw the Lord sitting on a high and lofty throne, Isaiah 6, you better know that one, the essence of God does not sit. He is not enclosed, encompassed, or circumscribed by any limit, for he is the one who determines limits. The seraphim are around him, not locatively speaking, but because they are nearer to God than man, because their nature is far more pure, wise, and clear-sighted than man's nature. In the end of this homily, Chrysostom laments about his wariness that has arisen from making numerous arguments about the incomprehensibility of God. But he's not tired from the great number of arguments. Rather, he writes, quote, My soul shudders and has become frightened since it has dwelt too long on speculations about heavenly matters. So what he's saying, he wants to get to the meat. He wants to get to the things that feed the soul. All right, so I think that's a good dichotomy he's making to my point about the negative language compared to the positive language. We, we want to hear things about God. Now, now, don't get me wrong, talking about God using neg negative qualifiers, I think, is definitely profound. It is. It is mind-boggling to think of God um, being eternal, um, incomprehensible, uh, immutable, all these things. So definitely they have their place to inform our worship, but obviously for Chrysostom, he doesn't want to dwell on those things. He wants to get to what the Bible expresses about God. And I think it's a really important thing to, to consider. So in homily four, um, Chrysostom continues pressing in on the Anomolians, citing Paul, who refers to the unfathomable, unfathomable riches of Christ, Ephesians 3, 5 through 7. Chrysostom exclaims, quote, what does he mean by unfathomable? End quote. It means the riches of Christ cannot be discovered, searched out, nor can we even find a trace. Chrysostom looks to the Apostle John to expand the cloud of support against the Anomians. He expounds on the implications in John's statement that, quote, no one has ever seen God. That's John 1.18. He recalls the previous examples given so far, whereby humans and creatures, where humans and creatures have seen God, and however, this was merely an act of accommodation and condescension of the weaknesses of creatures. So in slide six, he says here, no one writes Chrysostom, I'm sorry, it's not no one, it's not one of those prophets saw God's essence in its pure state from the fact that each one saw him in a different way. God is a simple being. He is not composed of parts. He is without form or figure. So here's the thing, too, I was thinking about right now. If he had parts, he could be seen. That's what I think, yeah. If he had parts, he could be seen. Well, or, nah, that's not true. That's not true. Because the angels, obviously, well, they have a simple essence. They have some kind of parts. They are, huh. I'll get back to that. 
Anyways, Chrysostom evidences his statement by the fact that all the prophets saw different forms and figures when they beheld God. Again, it is fascinating to note that the simple essence of God is a normative touchstone of his theology. However, this begs the question, what then did they see? The, see, the, the they being the prophets. As to the powers above, angels, seraphim, and cherubim, Chrysostom qualifies that sight is knowledge. They do not have material eyes like creatures have, so when scripture says they turn their eyes away, the intention is to demonstrate that not even the powers above can endure and comprehend God with a pure and perfect knowledge. To look fixedly on God means to know. The Apostle John understood that knowledge of God is beyond all comprehension, which is why he references the Son, who is seated at the right hand of God. He cites John 1.18 and obviously Psalm 110.1. And while this should be enough to silence the Anonomians, the Son is called the One Lord, 1 Corinthians 8.6, and the Unique Son. Now I need to clarify something. When I said they... A little bit back when I put so it says so when the scripture says they turn their eyes away and I said they was the prophets I'm sorry they are angels seraphim and cherubim so uh, they are correct myself there in case you probably caught that and said eh, prophets have eyeballs don't they anyway so in finishing his prologue this is back to the scriptures John makes the unquestionable assertion that while no one has seen God the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father has revealed this. Chrysostom notes that John gives the Son special excellence in designating the title only begotten to him. And therefore, we see he stands out from all the earthly notions of Son, and that among men, the name Son also belongs to us by analogy. But the title only begotten is Christ's alone, and belongs to no one else even by analogy. And if this is not enough to persuade the Anonomians, Christostom crassly asks, quote, Would the Father let himself have the Son in his bosom, unless the Son were of the same essence? End quote. And furthermore, quote, Could the Son endure to dwell in the Father's bosom, if the Son were of a nature inferior to the Father's? End quote. The manner of expression we see in the Apostle John means that we must understand that bosom equals knowledge. How else are we to understand the nature of Christ's sonship to the Father if he does not have a body? It's a good question. Chrysostom notes that we have two incontrovertible truths. God is the I am who I am, from which we understand he's eternal, and who is in the bosom of the Father teaches that the Son is in the bosom of the Father from all eternity. And here we see Christostom's proof that the Father and the Son are of the same essence, glory, majesty, and power, which the Arians and the Anonymians deny. So satisfied in his meticulous demonstration from Scripture that the essence of God is incomprehensible to every creature, Chrysostom proceeds to show that the Son and the Holy Spirit alone know God with full and perfect knowledge. After a detour, he returns to where he left off, and resuming his discussion regarding John 1.18, no one has ever seen God, the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father himself has declared him. Excuse me. This text, this text stems from John 6.46, <clears throat> where John noted Jesus' reply to the Jews stating, quote, Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God, he has seen the Father, end quote. Again, Chrysostom understands seeing as knowing, and he asserts that Jesus' intention of stating nobody, and then adds except the Son, is to exclude all created beings. Some ask why he excludes the Spirit. But the Spirit is not excluded. Nobody qualifies creatures only. The Spirit is not a creature. Chrysostom notes that the word nobody always is used to express the exclusion of creatures alone in the very matter of knowledge. To prove his point, Chris Austin looks to Paul to support two particular arguments. One, if the question is about the Father, it does not exclude the Son. And two, if it is about the Son, it does not reject the Spirit. His qualifiers show a normative assumption of interpretation, which is God is triune, 
Therefore, whatever is designated about a person pertains to all three, thus the being of God. In 1 Corinthians 2.11, Paul writes, For who knows a person's thoughts except his spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. So in comparing these two inspired statements, if we understood that both writers were excluding the Son, Paul, and the Spirit, John, from knowing God, then we have a contradiction. Either no one does not pertain to the Spirit in Christ, but refers specifically to creatures, or it does, and then the biblical writers were what? Incoherent. Chrysostom demonstrates a serious problem if we follow such logic, noting that the word one is used in the same way as no one and has the same force and power. He continues, consider this. Paul says, one God the Father from whom are all things, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things. If the Father is said to be one God, it excludes the Son from being God. If the Son is said to be one Lord, it excludes the Father from being Lord. But surely, the Father is not excluded from being Lord because of Paul's words, one Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, neither is the Son excluded from being God because of the words, one God, the Father. Oh, next page. Got a flip. The specific designations of the Father as one God and Jesus as one Lord do not exclude either person from the divine essence. Rather, Chrysostom writes that the very addition of the word Father designates a personal reality in God. If God can belong to and denote only that personal reality, the addition of the name Father would serve no purpose. The name God is common to both, the Father and the Son, so Paul's statement would be unclear if he did not specify the personal reality of the person he was referring. The Father is the first and unbegotten personal reality. Chrysostom looks at two specific passages, Matthew 22, 42 through 4, and Hebrews 1, 7 through 8, where both the Father and the Son are listed together being called Lord and God. In Matthew 22, 42 to 44, Jesus cites Psalm 1, speaking in the Spirit, who says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand. And then Jesus puts his audience to the test. He says, What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? David's, they say. And Jesus replies, If David calls him Lord, how then can be he be his son? Excuse me. Get some water again. Chrysostom asks, Do you see how both Father and Son are called Lord? Showing the Father and the Son together being called God in Hebrews 1, 7 through 8, citing David from Psalm 104, 4, the author attributes divinity to the Son when he writes, Your throne, O God, stands forever and ever. Therefore, God your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your fellows. Chrysostom goes on to show scriptural proofs from the Old Testament demonstrating that the word God is not greater than the name Lord. And I have them here listed on the slides. <clears throat> if you're just listening, um, it's Exodus 20, verse 2, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 13, Psalm 83, 19, and Psalm 147, 5. And then he observes Old Testament and New Testament passages where the Son is called God. Again, it's Isaiah 7, 14, 9, 6, Psalm 83, 19. Uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, Romans 9.5, Ephesians 5.5, 5, 2 Timothy 1.10, and Titus 2.13, for those of you just listening. Chrysostom notes, for the biblical writers do not give the impression, okay, hold on a second, for the biblical writers, not, sorry, I messed my words up here. I'll just read it and see if I can work it out. So, for the biblical writers do not give the impression that they were just referring to the Father when they spoke of God. They first made mention of the divine plan for salvation, of salvation. For surely, the Father was not born of a virgin, nor did he become a little child. His charge, or rather an interpretive rule of thumb to the Anonomians and all other heretics, is that when hearing the words one and no one, do not diminish the glory of the Trinity, but by these terms, 
learn the distance which separates the Trinity from created beings. This distance is infinitely vast, and an inferior essence would not be able to have clear knowledge of superior essence, i.e. traverse the infinite distance even if the difference between them were slight. End quote. Therefore, we must conclude the full divinity of the Son as the Father, because Scripture says the Son is in the bosom of the Father, that no one knows the Father except the Son, and no one has seen the Father except the Son. And also, we conclude the same of the Spirit, and that no one else knows the depths of God but the Spirit of God. I hope you're very impressed with, with his handling of the text to formulate these doctrines. Very, very good. Jumping to homily 7, Chrysostom moves into his second stage of wrestling with the heretics, where he addresses the question as to whether the Son and the Father have the same power and might, whether they are of the same essence. While he expresses his embarrassment of sorts in having to prove the Son is of the same essence, power, and might of the Father, nevertheless there are those who shamelessly oppose these truths. In fact, he remarks humorously that such notions are obvious in the very nature of things as observed in animals or even trees. <laughs> The Anomians claim it is evident that in stating that the Son is of the same sus substance with the Father because he is called the Son, we too can be of one substance with the Father, for surely we too are called his sons. Do you see the foolishness in their statement? That's my commentary, not uh, Chris Austin's. The psalmist quoting the Father writes, I have said you are gods, and all of you are the sons of the Most High. That's Psalm 82.6. Chrysostom decry decries their antics in that not only do they claim to have a knowledge of God as he is of himself, they now bring the glory of the Son down to their own level, positing that they are also sons of the Most High. But he rebuts them for violating the rules of analogy and that Christ is the archetype, the begotten, the Son, which alone is proper to him. Whereas the Anomians are sons only in word, they are not the only begotten. Only the Son lives in the bosom of the Father, is the brightness of his glory, is the exact representation of his being, and is in the form of God. Chrysostom shows how the Son demonstrates that he is of the same essence and power as the Father. To show this same likeness and essence, the Son says, He who has seen me has seen the Father. To show the same, oh, sorry, and I and the Father are one. These are from John 14, 9 and John 10, 30. To show the same likeness and power, the Son says, For as the Father raises the dead and grants life, so the Son also grants life to whom he wishes. That's John 5.21. To show that the Son is to receive identical worship as the Father, Jesus says, So that all men may honor the Son as they honor the Father. John 5.23. And to show that the Son has the same authority to amend the law, he says, The Father works and I work, John 5, 17. But the heretics stumble on the hypostatic union because they see weakness in the Lord Christ, particularly in wanting to let the cup of God's wrath pass from him and his shedding his blood in his prayer. That's in Luke 22, 42. <clears throat> Christosom follows the interpretive rule of the Economia Theologia distinction, stating that if the Son only showed what was proper to man, then people would have thought he was just a man. And if he only did what was proper to divinity, then no one would believe in the plan of redemption. It's an excellent point, and it's a key observation that we must remember, especially when we're dealing with our modern heretics of the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons. So we have to remember that, that Christ is showing both. And so we can't just think of the humanity of him as now just diminishing the divinity of him. He has to show both. He has to be fully both if he is to be both. The Anomians, Anomians, gosh, are mistaken because they have stretched the rules of interpretation. In contemporary theology, we would note their error of Biblicism. And Chrysostom defines the subtle yet gaping distinction between a biblical and Biblicist interpretation. He says today, I warn and advise you not to go merely to what is written, but to search out the meaning of what is said. If a person should busy himself with nothing more than what has been written, he will fall into many errors. In this mistake, this theologically grave error stems from a rigid anthropomorphism. 
I have said this often and will continue to do so. The interpreter falls into great error, distorting the plain meaning of the text when, for example, when Psalm 17.8 says, You will protect me in the shadow of your wings, are we to assume that God's spiritual and destructible essence has wings like a bird, a duck, or a flying squirrel? Are we to think that way? No, rather the metaphor provides a composite view of that which is incorporeal to communicate to us a true, metaphysically and or moral, statement about God. Chrysostom looks at the other examples, or looks at other examples, where one passage says God sleeps, Psalm forty four twenty four, and another says he does not, Jeremiah fourteen nine in the Septuagint. It says to interpret rightly Oh, oh I didn't use that slide. Hmm. Sorry about that. Um I forgot a slide. But to interpret rightly, Chrysostom emphasizes the importance of reason when searching into the treasure house of the divine scriptures. And he reiterates his warning. He says, if we listen to words only, if we do not think but take the words as they come, not only will those absurdities follow, but many a conflict will be seen in what has been said. Instructive for us to observe in Chrysostom's theology is the metaphysical framework behind and thus leading his interpretation. Now, my thesis throughout, this is me, not him, my thesis, is that interpretation is established at the metaphysical level, which informs one's hermeneutic. And we see this in how Chrysostom interprets these two supposedly conflicting passages. He writes, when, oh, I was right, actually, okay, all right, never mind. One man says that God sleeps, and another says that he does not sleep. Yet both statements are true if you understand the words in the proper way. And if, again, sorry for those who are listening, the one man who says God sleeps is from Psalm 44, 24, and the one that says he does not sleep is from Jeremiah 14, 19 in the Septuagint. Back to the quote. So the man who says that God is sleeping is pointing out God's forbearance and patience. The one who says he is not sleeping makes clear that God's nature is pure and undefiled. Now, Christostom's approach is indicative of the great tradition whereby the theological normative touchstone is a Trinitarian classical framework. Okay. Now, we're off to homily 9. Here, Christostom addresses objections from Jews of Antioch. These are Messianic Jews who have joined the Anonomians. Anonomian. Anonomians. Who deny the divinity of Christ. I guess we can't really call them Messianic Jews if they deny the divinity, but somehow they believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but they deny that he's divine. But Chrysostom easily deflates their arguments, showing their incompetence in interpreting the biblical text. For example, one evidence the Jews give to show that Jesus cannot be God is from John eleven thirty four, where Jesus does not know where, where dead Lazarus was lying. In mocking fashion, the Jews say, do you see that he did not know? Do you see his weakness? Is this man God? He did not even know the place. Now, a beginner or novice in biblical interpretation might be stumped by such an argument. But Chrysostom turns the tables. He says, if Jesus is not knowing where Lazarus was buried means that he cannot be God, then we must strip the father of his deity since he too failed to know where Adam was hiding in the garden. Genesis 3. Three nine, that's like a Chrysostom mic drop, boom. Did God not say, Adam, where are you? Or when God asks Cain where his brother is, should we infer that God is ignorant of Abel's whereabouts? And for another example, in Genesis eighteen twenty through twenty one, God tells Ab Abraham of the cries he hears against Sodom and Gomorrah, and that he must go down to see if their actions measure up to the outcry against them. Did God really have to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah? Did he not know? Chrysostom writes, The one who knows all things before they come to pass, the God who searches hearts and minds, he who knows the thoughts of men is the one and only one who has said, Therefore, I shall go down and see whether or not their actions match the outcry against them, which comes to me so that I may know. The Jews have fallen into error because, as Chrysostom warned earlier, they are making theological judgments based on what is written, not from the meaning of what is said. 
They are taking the words as they come and are quickly drawing conclusions without giving attention to whether their conclusions are canonically consistent regarding the being of God. This is very important. Canonical consistency is huge. It is a failure to understand the literary modes employed in Scripture looking at the meaning being conveyed in the mode of expression. The mode, not the meaning, is guiding their theological assumptions. Chrysostom's interpretation of Genesis 18, 20-21 demonstrates an acuity to the corpus of the Bible, notably the nature and character of God. Chrysostom writes, What the Father is saying this, and again, this is back to Genesis 18. The Father is saying this, A report came to me, but I wish again to test this rumor more exactly in light of the facts. I do not do this because I do not know. I do it because I wish to teach men not to heed words alone nor to believe them recklessly if someone speaks them against another. Men must believe what they hear only after they have first made an exact search and considered well the proof in light of the facts. Do you see the the moral the moral indicative he's given here, the moral story of that? Basically, if we hear something, we need to investigate to make sure it is so. And this is why God said in another scriptural passage, Believe not every word. For nothing is so destructive of men's lives as for a person to give quick credence to whatever people say. The prophet David was proclaiming a divine revelation when he said, Whoever slanders his neighbor in secret... Him have I banished and, per- and pursued. End quote. So Chrysostom interprets this passage from a canonical approach in that he understands the essence and character of God as revealed in Scripture and in general revelation. When he comes to a passage that presents a conflict with what Scripture teaches about the being of God, he gives priority to theology proper. His metaphysical understanding of the essence and attributes of God is the axiom driving his interpretation. So why is that? Because otherwise we lose continuity in the will and decree of God. If God claims to judge men by the secrets and intentions of their hearts, Romans 2.16, then he must have perfect, complete knowledge of the secrets and intentions of every human being, past, present, and future. If he cannot, then Solomon's closing statement of Ecclesiastes loses its thrust to instill fear of the Lord, but also provide comfort and hope, which says, For God will bring every act to judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. That's 12.14. In Chrysostom's reading of Genesis 18.20-21, if he takes the words as they come, interpreting them off the cuff, and concludes that the being of God must Go down and see and learn, okay, see and learn about the wickedness in Sodom and Gomorrah. His interpretation would conflict with Psalm 139, 7 through 8, which teaches us that the divine essence is omnipresent. David writes, Where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. Or how about in Jeremiah 23? Verses 23 to 24, excuse me, God condemning the false prophets who think their deception will go unnoticed says, Am I a God who is only near? This is the Lord's declaration, and not a God who is far away. Can a person hide in secret places where I cannot see him? The Lord's declaration, do I not fill the heavens and the earth? The Lord's declaration. So why should these passages have priority? For the text from Ecclesiastes to be true, it is necessary for Psalm 139, 7-8 and Jeremiah 23, 23-24 to be true. These passages tell us about the manner in which the divine essence subsists everywhere present all at once. For God to bring every act to judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil, his essence must be everywhere present all at once, as Proverbs 15.3, employing anthropomorphic language, tells us, quote, His eyes are everywhere observing the wicked and the good, end quote. Therefore, these passages must have priority. In fact, they must guide our interpretive decisions as we formulate theological judgments about the triune God. That's a great section, actually. I didn't realize now how good it is till talking through this. I mean, I think about, um, 
you know, that again, I mentioned before, there's, there's a lot of challenges in interpretation of, of being too speculative and, and focusing on just the attributes and, and not the biblical text, but really Chrysostom's approach is truly helpful and very balanced, very balanced because he's so right that God cannot exact judgment fairly, equally, and completely if he does not know completely every thought, act, deed, uh, whatever it is, word spoken, everywhere without without missing anything. Nothing can escape him, right? So I think it's uh, 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 truly, truly important that if you're listening and watching, that you really um, grasp what he's saying and apply it to your hermeneutic. Well, not apply it. It should be the standard. It should be, the, again, that's a canonical, contextual approach. <clears throat> okay, homily 10. Chrysostom addresses the claim that Christ is inferior to the Father because he took on flesh. He addresses this assertion on the heels of demonstrating that Christ is the same essence of the Father as observed in his authority to forgive sins and cast into hell, to make laws of his own, healing the sick, restoring limbs, restoring sight to the blind with mud, just as God took dust from the earth and foreign man and calling the dead to life. All of these examples, writes Chrysostom, quote, surely makes it clear that Christ is the same essence as the Father who begot him, end quote. The enemies of truth posit that if he were of the same essence of the Father, why didn't the Father take on flesh? He must have assumed the form of man because he was the inferior one. Excuse me. So that's their logic, that of the two, if Christ took on flesh and took on a an existence which ultimately we would say is less than the Father, then Christ must inherently be the inferior one. But Chrysostom is going to show how this logic is absurd. Oh, one second. I'm going to wipe my nose real quick. Chrysostom refers to Paul's words in Philippians 2, observing that if Christ put on flesh as an act of humility but was inferior, the thrust of Paul's exhortation to look to Christ as the example of humility dissipates. There's a great quote. It is an act of humility when an equal obeys an equal. See where we're going with this? Philippians 2.6 is a powerful creedal imperative in that we have one of the rare instances of a direct, explicit statement of the deity of Christ. Chrysostom writes, what does it mean when he says he did not consider it robbery to equal to be equal with God, but he emptied himself, taking the nature of a servant? Christ has no fear of losing a possession with, that cannot be taken away from him, even though his possession is hidden away. Chrysostom expounds further, noting that the equality he had with the Father was solely his, a glory that was truly and genuinely his by nature. Chrysostom emphasizes that the Incarnation demonstrates the Son's equality with the Father, keeping the same glory that alone belongs to God. If Christ were not of the same glory and essence as the Father, the Incarnation loses all significance. It is dumbfounding that, that the God of the universe would become part of the universe in the most lowly and humble manner among the very creatures he commanded to rule over. In homily 11, uh, Christosom considers the glory of the Son and the equality and consubstantiality. <laughs> consubstantiality. Consubstantiality he has with the Father demonstrated in his display of power. See, this is why I can never teach in a seminary classroom. I'd be like just fumbling over these words, having to do it over again. So I'm just, I'm just a. Uh, behind the computer theologian. That's all I can really do. This is, this is the extent of how I can teach. Anyways, okay. Uh, Chrysostom chooses to begin his fight, his fight with the weapons taken from the Old Testament. His purpose is to strike down the heretics of his day, along with the likes of Marcion, Manichaeus, Valentinus, and all Jewish communities. Chrysostom begins with the creation account, summarizing all the days of divine fiat, whereby the command of creation is carried out by the only begotten. His aim is to refute the notion that the Son is merely a servant of God. Chrysostom notes that when man was formed, Genesis 1, 26-27, God does not give the command of, let there be, rather he says, let us make, so that from the character of the consultation indicated by his words, he might reveal the equality of honor which belonged to him, 
to whom he spoke, end quote. So when God's saying, let us make man, he denotes that there is one image, not images, nor one image unequal to the other image, but rather the same image. And while God has no need for a counselor, Scripture shows the honor and equality of the Son with, with God by calling the Son Wonderful Counselor. And those of you listening, he was talking about Isaiah 40, verse 13, compared to Isaiah, 4, Isaiah, 9, Isaiah 9, verse 6. Chrysostom's Christological import in Genesis and Isaiah is indicative of a Trinitarian license of interpretation. Those are my words, not his. Um, okay. So Homily 12 continues his discourse of the glory of the Son from the Old Testament text, but Chrysostom shifts to the New Testament to demonstrate his glory. A standout example is drawn from Jesus' healing of the paralytic. Not only did he heal him, but he also told him to pick up his bed and walk, showing a complete restoral to health. Chrysostom comments on the reason why Jesus had him do this. He writes, Unless his limbs had been made solid and his joints held fast, he would not have been able to support the weight on his shoulders. In addition to all this, he is also showed that when Christ gave the command, everything happened in a single moment. He was both free from his disease and returned to health. End quote. This is a brilliant observation which we don't always think about. This is what he says. When a, when a physician helps a patient, he is unable to bring him back to immediate perfect health. It takes time with the patient slowly regaining his strength back, but not with Jesus. In a single moment, he both frees from disease and restores to health. And I think that's just a great observation. When the paralytic's been there for decades, he gets up and walks. I mean, think about it. If you were laying anywhere for even a year and didn't move, your legs would completely atrophy. So, again, these are very helpful observations when it comes to understanding uh the, the nature of Christ and his ability to do those things that only God can do. <clears throat> um, so at this point, Christosom addresses those he calls busy bodies. That is the pejorative term he uses when speaking of the Anomoians. And their folly and ultimate demise is that they inquire about God's essence, particularly how he brought about complete restoration, health, and strength to the paralytic's body. Christosom, in step with the title of his treatise, says, Marvel at what was done. Do not be inquisitive about the way it was done. End quote. And Chrysostom ends his homily and treatise with a proof of the Son's equality with the Father from John 5, when Jesus asserts his authority above the Sabbath while healing a sick person. Chrysostom notes a salient point for the reader to pay attention to, which is the crux of the whole struggle. This is why they kept persecuting him, because he did these things on the Sabbath. So, the stakes are high on this claim because how Jesus responds will conclusively demonstrate he's either a servant or in command. <clears throat> so according to the law of Moses, a man would be stoned to death for carrying wood on the Sabbath. And even though the Jews observe a miracle, an act beyond human power, they are infuriated with him because he did it on the Sabbath. So how does Christ respond to this charge? He says, John 5.17, my father is still working, and I am working also. Chrysostom contends that if Christ were inferior, his response was grounds for a more serious charge. End quote. He did not say he does this because the father does, which would be a heinous violation of the law. Rather, his claim situates him equal with the father, which the Jews understood he was asserting and is why they wanted to kill him. Chrysostom offers an example stating that an imperial, I'm sorry, an emperor or king is the only one allowed to wear the crown in pardoning criminals. If a mere commoner were pardoning criminals and he defended his unlawful actions by stating he wears the crown just as the king does, he'd be put to death. Important to remember is that Christ was sinless, keeping the law completely. Therefore, he would not have used this kind of plea to defend himself. When confronted about his actions, Christ defends himself with authority, establishing he is of the same dignity of the Father. In that when he accused when he is accused of breaking the Sabbath, asserting he does these things because he works as the Father is working, Chrysostom writes, quote, It is altogether necessary that Christ be equal to the Father, who also acts with authority. End quote. In conclusion, in Christostom, we see a theologian who reads scripture 
with the utmost attention to developing theology from the biblical text. He seeks to be theologically responsible, avoiding as much possible any speculative discourse. He carefully and patiently argues his position with stunningly rich exegesis, well-grounded in revelation with a fully systematic scope of vision. Interestingly, as it pertains to a key theme of investigation in this book, Chrysostom assumes the doctrine of divine simplicity as normative in the Christian doctrine of God. It is telling about the immensely important role of metaphysics, notably the metaphysic that purports divine simplicity, and that one such as Chrysostom adopts it as properly basic of his doctrine of God. All right, so we are done with John Chrysostom. Uh, the slide here noted is the book I recommend getting on the nature on the incomprehensible nature of God. This one is done as part of the Fathers of the Church series. I think it's like 128 of these. So excellent books. A lot of them you can actually get free on Google. Uh, Google Books. Uh, you can download the PDF versions of them for free. So it's pretty awesome. Me, I like a paper print book. So um, although I don't have it paper print. So <laughs> anyways, but I can hope you enjoyed uh, this lesson tonight. Again, Chris Austin, I recommend probably listening again. His method of exegesis, I think is absolutely just spot on. Uh, definitely grow a lot and really help balance out our interpretive approaches to the Bible. So with that said, uh, God bless and we will see you next time.